Live from the Mecca, Mormon Salt Lake City, this is Heart of the Matter, where Mormonism meets biblical Christianity face-to-face. -face, I'm your host, Sean McCraney. We praise the true and living God for allowing us to participate in this, his ministry. May he be with you and us tonight. Hey, we want to thank all of you for your support. In whatever way you are led and willing to give it, the ministry is unique in that our primary objective is to seek and teach the truth, the truth, no matter where it is and no matter how it comes. So kind of being unrestricted by the demands of men while it's liberating, uh, it is also quite taxing on remaining sustainable because sustainability is often based in this world on pleasing people, not ticking them off. So for those of you who have understood our purpose and approach, and have chosen to remain supportive in prayer and our partners and, and uh, people who share the show. We really do thank you for any and every sacrifice that you have made to keep heart of the matter and Aletheia Ministries going. With that, how about a moment from the word? I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. One of the immeasurable beauties found in the true gospel of Jesus Christ is the fact that true believers in Jesus are known by him, and we are forgiven by him, we are mediated before the Father by him, and we are in the end judged by him. He is well aware of those who are his and those who are not. Well, you may ask, what happens to those who have not believed on him or who have embraced another gospel or philosophy or promised uh, a way of heaven that is not him? Will Jesus judge them? We know that the Father has placed all judgment in the hands of his son, after all, the son paid for the vast world sin. But we might wonder, what will Jesus judge us by if we never really knew or received him? Will non-believers in Christ be judged by the law? What if they never received the law? Will they be judged by the rules or philosophies that they have embraced? In John 5.45, we read a very interesting passage from the Lord. Uh, and it's interesting, he's talking to the Jews around him about judgment, and he said, do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom you trust. I take this to mean in the case of the Jews who rejected Jesus, his gospel, the grace it affords, that they will be judged according to what the law of Moses says which they preferred to him or trusted in lieu of trusting Christ. I would be so bold, and I could be wrong, absolutely, but I would think that those who have embraced the tenets of Islam to reach God and what Islam provides for salvation will be judged by the tenets of Islam. And uh, those who have chosen to follow Muhammad and those who have cho uh, chosen to follow Joseph Smith those who have chosen to follow whatever prophet or person or book or philosophy that it is, those things will be laid before them and they will be judged according to how those things have prepared them to enter into the kingdom of God or not. So when it comes to the Latter-day Saints, my heart breaks in light of this idea for several reasons. First, unlike what the LDS propose, there is no system of grace and works. They propose grace and and works, but it's not possible. It's one or the other. So if they die believing they're gonna be judged by a law of grace and works, good luck. Remember Romans eleven six says it well. And if by grace, then it is no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. And if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. The LDS have tried to meld the two together, making the good news not so good after all. Now, of late, the LDS are publicly claiming that salvation is all grace, 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 grace. They're really pushing this in the public uh, and social media forums. 
but then they'll add, but exaltation is works, 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 works. But this is an obfuscation of the truth because uh, their own doctrine teaches that salvation is tied to things, just salvation, not exaltation, to things like uh, the LDS baptism, which would be seen as a work. So listen, either Jesus is a person's way and truth, and we will be judged and mediated by him or not. It's simple as that. Taking all this into the account, into account, the LDS are guilty of having chosen to follow Joseph Smith and his views rather than Christ and what he said are the means of salvation, forcing us to sadly suggest that they will therefore be judged by Smith's teaching they believed and received. And that makes this most heartbreaking is they have accepted a grace and works soteriology. It's a, I am saved by grace after all that I can work and do. The law, uh, the law that Mormonism promotes is an impossibility to meet. And so let me give you an example. Galatians 3.10, this is what it says. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So if you try to say, first of all, we have a passage that says grace is all alone and works is all alone. They cannot be interchangeable or melded together. And now we have one that says, if you are going to go by works, if you're going to go by the works of the law, you have to obey it completely. Otherwise, you are in trouble. You have to continue in everything that is written in the law. So they have their baptismal covenants they have to live up to and their temple endowments and living up to the words of their uh, pr pr prophet and apostles. And it's endless. And so they are going to be constantly guilty of failing to obey. And by these failures, because they have appealed to the law to justify themselves before God, they will be found guilty. And uh, that's why I've said when I go to, on Sundays and I'm in a restaurant and I see Latter-day Saints come in all happy and jovial in their, in their get-ups, and I just, you know, you just say Sabbath day. And they get so sheepish. Oh, oh yeah, Sabbath day. And, and some of them get combative, you know. Well, well, you know, you're breaking the Sabbath day. No, I'm not. I don't believe in the Sabbath day. It doesn't apply to me. It applies to the Jews. The problem is you believe in the Sabbath day and you're willingly breaking it. That is one of the saddest things that happens in Mormonism. And with that, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we pray that you will be with our viewers, whether here in the studio, those who are going to be watching live streaming throughout the nation and world, and of course in our archives and on YouTube and people who pick up the show, we pray that you will open hearts and ears and eyes, that they will hear the truth, discard those things that are not true, and seek you, that you will lead them and guide them, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, just a sec. We have been covering and comparing a summary of John Calvin's system of Christian doctrines for salvation to those with the, jo with the founder of Mormonism, Joseph Smith. Now, Calvinism, he, Calvin had an expansive explanation that has been boiled down to an acronym, and, and I know many of you know this, and it's TULIP, and it stands for Total Depravity, which we covered two weeks ago. Unconditional election, which we're covering tonight. Limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. So let's talk about the Calvinistic teaching summarized by the term unconditional election, and then we'll explore Mormonism's view of the same. The Apostle Paul clearly explained that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. With this being the case, none of us deserve salvation as we have all chosen darkness over light to some extent or another in opposition to our conscience, to what we see in nature, etc., etc., as mentioned in Romans 1. Our state harkens back to that first premise we talked about of total depravity, um, with humans being incapable of choosing God on our own, the whole of us, all of us, says Calvin, 
are totally depraved, meaning we will always choose our will over his. And in this state of depravity, we have all sinned and have come short of the glory of God. Interestingly, Calvin paradoxically also taught that God loves all of his creations and desires that all might be saved. He had to teach this, it's biblical by the way, but for some reason in his mind, this God of love determined that most would not be redeemed. I don't know why. But in order to save some, here's the, here's the deal, and again, according to scripture, that number is gonna be very few, God, being sovereign, elected a group of people, of us reprobates, to salvation by his own goodwill and pleasure and well before any of us were even physical realities, okay? In electing some, God also chose of his own goodwill and pleasure to place the remainder in hell or in the lake of fire where they will burn forever and ever and ever. These are not people who are horrid murderers, serial killers, but they could be anyone God has not elected. Little grandma who, who faithfully served the community or 12 year old girls who love dolls and flowers before they're taken and babies all created by God's goodwill and pleasure for hell. That never ends. Now, just in case those who have been elected start to think that they were elected to salvation because they're so good and they're all that, um, Calvin clearly explains that the elect are chosen not because of any act of goodness present in them, but solely based on God's sovereign will. Calvin suggested that by God saving some, we are given a tremendous example of his mercy since we all deserve hellfire to begin with. That's the thinking. If we sort of work it backward, not one of us deserves God's love and mercy, which I agree is true if you think about it in that way, but to show his great love and mercy, he decided to save some reprobates while leaving the rest to become eternal kindling in the lake of fire. This perspective teaches that the unsaved reprobates are unconditionally damned to hell for eternity, while the unconditionally elected, that's our topic for tonight, unconditional election, the second point, have been elect um, to life. Another way this point is presented is that the elect have been predestined to salvation, while the damned have been predestined to destruction, you cannot alter that predestination that is upon each of us. Now, the basis, uh, okay, the basis for the perspective, if you really want to understand Calvinism and all five points, it's completely planted in the idea of the sovereignty of God. He is completely sovereign, and so you will understand it better uh, that his will is always done to the exclusion or inclusion of anything men and women do. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. So in the doctrine of predestination, five-point Calvinism affirms God's sovereignty and states that it is his perfect will, unaffected by deeds or actions on our part, which decides that some are saved and the rest will burn eternally. The fact that God predestines some to eternal life, so here's one point, and another group to eternal damnation is known as double predestination because he predestines to life and he predestines to hell. <laughs> that was a terrible phony laugh, but I cannot believe this, this stuff. I mean, I have never heard a bigger pile of garbage in my life. In terms of ridiculousness, it runs right up there with Joseph Smith's King Follett discourse who said God was once a man. I mean, it's right, it's the same, it's, a, it's the same idiocy when you think about it. Okay, I'll get professional to try to impress you through my genteel articulation. 
about how right I am. In his explanation of unconditional election, R.C. Sproul, a scholar living today, who's on the radio all the time, is respected here and far and wide in the Christian community, said the following about unconditional election. Listen closely to the word choice in this quote. Our final destination, heaven or hell, is decided by God, not only before we get here, but before we are even born. It teaches that our ultimate destiny is in the hands of God. Another way of saying it is this, from all eternity, before we ever live, God decided to save some members of the human race and to let the rest of the human race perish. God made a choice. He chose some individuals to be saved unto everlasting blessedness in heaven, and others he chose to pass over to allow them to follow the consequences of their sins into eternal torment in hell. R.C. Sproul. What has always intrigued me is the mindset of those people who love and embrace five-point Calvinism. Uh, first of all, the people who love it are never the ones on the eternal damnation end of it. <laughs> they, always love, uh, they always love Calvinism because they're one of the ones who were chosen. And they just don't seem, it doesn't seem to affect them at all that most of this world, trillions of people, are going to burn forever in a literal fire of hell because of God's loving will. But they were elected, so they just love it. It's a, it's a joy. Then, in light of the command to love, I cannot for the life of me understand anyone who is comfortable with the notion that while they have been chosen, Trillions of other people are going to suffer eternally, burning alive in the flames of a second death. No choice of their own. God just didn't want to save them. What seems to truly comfort those who have uh, embraced five-point Calvinism is the fact that since God has elected them without them doing anything, it's impossible for them to lose their salvation, you see, because they didn't, they didn't believe they didn't have the will to choose. He just said, you, because of my will, are saved, and the other 10 are in hell. And they say, I couldn't do anything to be saved. I didn't have to believe. He made me believe. I didn't have to have faith. He gave me the faith. Everything is there, so I can never lose what he has given me. And we're going to get to that in the end. Now, I understand the biblical premise of resting and trusting in God. And, and to believe in his promises. But what comes attached with this reform view is frankly unconscionable. And these tenets attached to the eternal security of five-point Calvinists were unconscionable to Joseph Smith as well. See, there's no free will in five-point Calvinism. God not only manages everything and has managed everything from the beginning, he micromanages every last detail in the scope of the all. Being sovereign, he made me do this. And being sovereign, he made me do this. He knew I would do it. I didn't do it. He made me do this. He made me do that. That's God. We're just puppets. He has done all of it, and he planned it all, and there's absolutely no free will. It's him. And we then are not culpable. Therefore, if he chose to save us, then we are his and I don't have to worry about a thing. The result in the Calvinist mind is that all of us, whether we ever drew a single breath, were either saved or damned and there's no in between at all. Well, Joseph Smith Jr.'s father and I believe his grandfather, Asael, and his brother were not fond of this idiotic take on uh, a loving God and how he works to redeem man. And we really can't blame him, can we? So in their opinion, God, being sovereign in love, would work his ways to somehow bring all creations under heaven to his side. We would call this universalism today, which properly defined mean all roads lead to heaven, Jesus is not necessary, and there is no hell where people are going to be cast into because a loving God would never do that. That's the best definition of true universalism. From the early writings of Joseph Smith Jr., however, it seemed he was more of an Arminianist than a universalist or certainly a Calvinist. Arminians downplay the sovereignty of God to some extent, 
and make free will a major factor in the salvation of man, as well as their own works of righteousness in maintaining their salvation. Theologians call the Arminius view of, salv of salvation synergistic, and they call it that because uh, Arminians believe that God and man are synergistically working to bring about their, uh, the salvation. So that's why we have work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's a very Arminius view, even though the next verse says, though it is God who is working in us to accomplish it. Now, Calvinism would be seen as monarch, uh, uh, excuse me, monergistic because it's directly from God down. We don't have anything to do with it. It's God down. It's one single mono down on you, and that's it. The Arminius is synergistic. So instead of presenting a viable biblical, let me say this again. Instead of presenting a viable biblical answer to Calvin's five points, Smith, as he was wont to do, came up with explanations straight out of his own imagination. And from them, he was able to appeal to some of the biblical notions of a sovereign God while retaining God's justice and mercy and love along the way. Additionally, he was able to make his father and grandfather happy by giving everyone a chance to experience some sort of redemption. It was a form of universalism, all the while honoring the Arminius constructs of free will and the command to do good works to ensure your salvation in the long run. I've always described Smith as one of the great synthesizers of religious thought. He was able to get these ideas off the ground by introducing a Hellenistic thought he could have borrowed from Swedenborg about a pre-existence, a pre-mortal existence. It was both a Greek teaching and then Swedenborg popularized it in his writings as well. Well, Smith was able to answer Calvin's predestin predestination thing by bringing in a pre-existence. You see, and he could make it just because if man existed before coming to this earth and acted as free agents, he was able to establish himself as either good or lukewarm or evil uh, and a fair or sovereign God could then foreordain instead of predestine, foreordain those spirits to go and be certain types of peoples when they came to this earth and then God would work with their own, their free will, their free agency to bring them about to the best that he could or they would, they would fail. Now the idea is wholly without biblical merit. In fact, Jesus, he refuted the Hellenistic idea of a preexistence, constantly saying, I'm from above, you're from beneath. Don't even think that we are of the same uh, uh, genus, so to speak. But with Smith's plan, um, God would use the free will choices of all made in this fictional preexistence and then rule and reign as a sovereign, loving father manager, so to speak, over the human race, if you will, and try to get us all to improve. So Smith took the Arminius constructs further. Just because someone was ordained in the premortal existence to do something doesn't mean they will. So he removed predestination from the whole mix. I'm sure he hated that idea. I think he really liked the idea of freedom, and he played freedom up a lot in, in what he said and taught. So free will still reigns. And in this slide, this is why the LDS are commonly heard saying, many are called, but few are chosen. They are referring this to their pre-existent call for ordination to go forward and do good things, but not many actually live up to it because of Satan or, or sin or bad choices or whatever, blindness, whatever it is. So Smith, in my estimation, he hated restrictions. He leaned far closer to the Arminius view of salvation because it appeals plainly to freedom of the human will, a concept that was uh, anathema to John Calvin. Additionally, Smith rejected the idea that God would ever predestine anyone to eternal hell, but maintained that man has the ability to alter and change his course by and through his own choices, thus ignoring uh, five-point Calvinism's first premise of total depravity. The LDS prophet, Joseph Fielding Smith, said, Every soul coming into this world came here with the promise that through obedience he would receive the blessings of salvation. No person was foreordained or appointed to sin or to perform a mission of evil. No person is ever predestined to salvation or damnation. 
Every person has free agency. Cain was promised by the Lord that if he would do well, he would be accepted. Judas had his agency and acted upon it. No pressure was brought to bear on him to cause him to betray the Lord. But he was led by Lucifer. If men were appointed to sin and betray their brethren, then justice could not demand that they be punished for sin and betrayal when they are guilty. So we have a real radical uh, revision of both Calvinism and Arminianism uh, by, by and through Joseph Smith and his thinking, and then as that's grown by the LDS prophets of old. Additionally, LDS founder Smith tried to pour water on five-point Calvinism in and through his Book of Mormon. We're going to wrap it up with this thought. Yes, the work does contain some smackings of total depravity and the like, but in the end, the book is primarily an Arminius response to the ugly chimera uh, of Calvinism introduced to the world at the time of the Reformation. Unfortunately, from the Book of Mormon myth, Smith continued to step outside of the pale of biblical support to refute Calvin's ideas when, if he had taken the time and would have reined in his ego and imagination, he could have torn the thing apart from an authentic text instead of through personally compiled pseudopigrapha. So in the face of Calvin's five-point and Arminianism's free will, I want to ask you, is there a common ground of biblical reason to be had? Can we give God a chance to make sense? Is it possible, using only the Bible to prove that, yes, God is holy and completely sovereign, that Jesus is the only way, that God does elect some to life and others to death? Those are in there. These are passages while allowing free will of humans to exist in the company of his unending and undying love. Is that possible? Is it possible for a loving God to allow for a hell of darkness and pain and for a lake of fire to exist? Is it possible for holy, depraved humankind to be unconditionally elected by holy God to life? Think on those things, because we're going to cover them as we continue on in the following week, covering the last three points of Calvinism. But I will say this. Anything, all of it, happens only in and through the sac sacrifice and life of his only begotten son. More on that next week. Let's open up the phone lines, 801-590-8413. While the operators are clearing your call, we have two, Mark and Byron, 801-590-8413. We're going to show you this and come back and take it from Mark and Byron. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, back. HOTM.TV, if you're interested in that, we want to thank Calvary Chapel Cedar City, Utah, Pastor Joe, who supported Aletheia Ministries for many years in many different ways. We love him and what he represents 
in working for the king. We have Mark from Boise, Idaho on line one. Mark, you're on Heart of the Mater. Mark? Yeah, yeah I'm here. You're on the air. All right. I just wanted to tell you a great job. Yeah. Thanks, yeah, Mark. I just had a question for you. All right. Is, is that a tattoo? A tattoo on your hand? What? Where? Yeah, that one. <laughs> Do we have a delay? Or, Mark, have you been dipping in the... Mark, uh, you, you know what? I have, a, I have a paper in front of me to explain this, but I might as well explain it now. Yes, this is a tattoo. Why do I have it? A number of reasons. One, I've always hated tattoos. I've always looked down on people who have tattoos. I find I always... What? I always consider them to be of the criminal type and lowlifes and girls that I could take advantage of in my younger days. And, and so... Uh, uh, that I've, I've always bore that with me, and so that's one reason I wanted to say I am no better. Second, I've always wanted one, really, kind of, but I have three daughters, and I didn't want them to get any, and so I made them promise that if, as 52 years of age, if I got a tattoo, that they wouldn't do it, and then I got one, and then they all said they're going to go get one now, and uh, I told them if they did, I'm cutting my hand off and sending it to them, so maybe that'll keep them from doing it. The next thing is in Utah, the prophet of the LDS church said, no tattoo. So it kind of plays along with my whole shtick. It, you know, the crosses and the, and the get-ups. And now I've got this when I sit in public places. This, And then another one is I tell people, when I flip you off, you'll know I'm a Christian. And uh, that's kind of a joke. And then people want to know why they say when you look at tattoos, you're, you're supposed to look at them like when you look at that, it should it should be the other way. They say my tattoo's upside down, and my thinking, right. my thinking, Mark, is that when you're just walking along, no one can tell that you're a Christian, so you have to actually do something, and I have to make, take an action and lift my hands, an action, and then people can see that I'm a Christian. Also, when I look at it, I have to see that I'm a Christian first before anyone else can see that I'm a Christian. So all of that played into my decision to go down to Cathedral in Salt Lake City and be tortured for 45 minutes with this beautiful tattoo. All right. Well, hey, that sounds good. I was just curious. I was just curious what the... The verse in the Bible refers to as uh, do not mark the temple up. Yeah, you know who that's talking about in that verse? No. It's, talk, it's talking about the high priest. So the high, if I was a high priest and I was expecting to go in once a year and offer up oblations and sacrifice for the people, that's true. I wasn't to take upon myself a mark my flesh like the pagan communities would. That's the context. The other thing is, Paul says that he bears the mark of Christ in his flesh. We don't know what that means. I consider this to be an example of that. And also, Revelation says that Jesus will have a uh, uh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords written on his thigh. So to me, that sounds like some sort of tattoo. Besides, the alternative would have been, I burn this into my hand, and that would be so much more unsightly. Yeah. All right, well, hey, I'm, all, I'm not even against it. It's great. I just always thought the temple is our bodies, and to go get a tattoo is marking your temple, so I just never, I think I'll go get one. It looks good. All right, my brother. Thanks for the call. Keep watching. All right. Okay, bye-bye. See you later. Okay, we're going to Byron in Kokomo, Indiana. Byron. Hello. Hello, Byron. Hello, Sean. I wanted to call and say I really appreciated the program and been watching for a couple of months on NRB. Oh. And uh, been watching some of your back episodes and stuff. Well, thank you for and watching. I'm a Christian author uh -huh. here in Indiana, and uh, I really like when somebody... Uh, opens up the Bible and reads and, and, and talks about studying and, and getting into the Word and, and wanting people to believe what the Word says. And I appreciate that very much. Thanks, Byron. 
So what's happened? What else? Studying the Word and, and, and listening to good Bible ministers and, and Bible studies and reading. Well, thanks so much for calling, Byron. God bless you, my brother. God bless you. Thank you much. Bye-bye. All right. Um, from Dale in North Reading, Mass., I've been watching the Temple video, and you asked impressions of people who are not LDS, and I'm not LDS, and to me, it's like a Disney World exhibit. It's really so sad that people think this stuff is real. It's very scary to me. Um, you know, I, I realize uh, more and more when you step away from something and you look at it with, with eyes that are not connected to the problem, uh, you can see much more clearly. Einstein said something amazing. Um, he said, we cannot solve our problems with the same level of thinking that we created them with. You see, so if you're in, in, a, in a system, if you're in something that you help create, and you're involved in that, you can't solve that while you're in it. And not at least with the same level of thinking. So there has to be some sort of apostasy from that type of thinking in order to see clearly how to fix the problem. And so they have a built-in mechanism to prevent that. They say if you start to fall away, that you are a, a bad person, instead of stepping away is a sign of being healthy. So, um, and that's one of the reasons I tell people who are raising children and they want, and they're Christian, I say, don't teach your children they're Christian. Don't raise them up as Christians. I would raise them up as, hey, mom and dad believe this. You can search things out. You're not a Christian just because you come to church. You know, God doesn't have any grandchildren, so to speak. You gotta find your way yourself because if they're raised to believe they're Christian, they're part of the problem and they grow up still part of that problem, and then they have to extricate themselves from that by doing wild things or whatever it is in order to see if they really believe it or not. So you want to be separate from things until you are capable of really wanting to receive it. And uh, I think Einstein was kind of saying that. We have Heather in Tuile on line one. Heather, you're on Heart of the Matter. Hello? I'm here, I'm here. Oh my gosh, I'm so nervous to be on your show. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, don't be, Heather. <laughs> okay, so um, I just wanted to say thank you, and I love you, and I think you're amazing, and I love the work you're doing, and um, I'm just so excited. I was a Mormon, and I'm not anymore, and I'm so excited. And Round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> you have about 400 people applauding you right now. <laughs> I am so excited, seriously. Like, it has been this amazing eye-opener, and I'm just so, I, I can't even believe it. I'm, I'm just so excited. To, That's awesome. To just be done with all of that and to wash my hands, basically. And, like, now, like you said, looking back at it, like, with different eyes, like, it, it is. It's scary. Like, I, I'm, I'm just mortified that I was ever a part of it, and I'm so excited to be done. Good. So, so. did you have a comment, a question beyond that? I don't think so. I just wanted to say hi, and, and I think you're amazing, and thank um, you for all your work. I just, I, I think you're awesome. Heather, where are you going to church out there in Tooele? Um, There is a little Christian church. Gosh, I think it's, it's the Christian Fellowship, and it is on Garden Street and Vine, and um, the little pastor there is named Stan. He's amazing, and... He reads right out of the Bible, verse for verse. And Good. I just, I love it, and I'm so excited to not be going to the, the Mormon church on the corner anymore. <laughs> That's really exciting, Heather. We're, we're happy for you. Thanks for watching. Thank you. Have okay. a great night. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye. Okay, uh, from Richard, he said, the best way to gauge accuracy of anyone's faith as a Christian faith is their adherence to the Nicene Creed. Arguments have been made over many centuries dating to the time of Christ as to who and who is not a Christian. Many of them, uh, many of them sects with views step in step with Mormonism that have been exclusively in the Catholic era of Christianity. See groups such as the Arians, Donatists, et cetera, et cetera. And anyway, he's saying, if you take the uh, Nicene Creed, you will have a certain perfect guideline to tell if you're a Christian or not. 
and Richard, while much of what occurred at Nicaea, in my opinion, was fine, there were some results I would really seriously wonder about, especially, in particular, how, they, how the construction of the Trinity was explained and then how it came through the Athanasian Creed, and those two things are kind of in conflict with each other. Uh, it's not that I don't believe Jesus was God, and it's not that I don't believe there's a Father, and it's not that I don't believe that there's a Holy Spirit, but the Trinity concept uh, uh, that came about from that first Council of Nicaea when Constantine, the emperor, the murderous emperor, uh, brought together and made it a state religion, I wonder about some of those things, and we're going to talk about those in the, in the months to come relative to Mormonism. So nevertheless, 9C Creed has good stuff, and it was a good summary of stuff, but there's some things I still wonder about, so thanks for that. We're going to Janet in Athens, Alabama, and then Jerry in Wyoming. Janet from Athens, what's happening? Well, I came out of the church last year, October of last year, and... Wait a second, listen to this! <laughs> Actually, my, my entire family, my husband and my four sons, and now um, my daughter is also going to pretty soon. That is wonderful, Janet. Well, I have a question. I live in the South, and I have not found a church because I'm still kind of iffy about trusting anyone. And I would like to know what in the heck is a, um, oh, gosh, it left my head. Um, they have them all the time here. After? It's called, it starts with an R. Revival? Oh, I'm having Revival? Yes, what is a revival? <laughs> well, you just sort of expressed it in your voice. Um, a revival is uh, where men and women get together. It used to happen often in tents. They were traveling, and pastors who were traveling, ministers would go around, and they'd come to town, and they would call people to repentance and uh, make the sinners of the town come forward and renew themselves in Christ or they would also have an altar call and people would come forward and having heard the gospel at the revival from the pastor at the pulpit would then dedicate their lives to Christ, ask to, to be received. Billy Graham sort of did revivals as he traveled around and was an evangelist. Billy Sunday, there's been a number of them. And so I guess local churches today, I know some that will have their own revivals and it's just kind of an opportunity to open up the doors, so to speak, for people in the community to consider Christ, to come to him, and they flow in, good uh, rock and music typically, and a powerful speaker, and uh, then they have a, an altar call and people can give their lives to Christ then. Oh, so you, you, you have to join their church then? Is that how, what the... It depends, I guess, on who's holding the revival. Billy Graham, he, he always said at the end of his message, now go find a church. Billy Sunday, I was just talking about this, uh, Billy Sunday was as big as Billy Graham uh, before him, and uh, he had revivals all over the place, and all kinds of hundreds of thousands of people were saved, and at the end of Billy Sunday's life, he said, I have woven ropes of sand. And you know what he meant by that was, look, I come up, I give this message, people are fervently excited, they come forward, they, they, uh, they give their life, and they walk away, and after a week, they go back to the bar and the, and the wife next door. Uh, so uh, revivals have their place, but they really need to be followed up by a church that is going to continue to teach you in the word and fellowship with you and love you, things like that. Okay. Does that help? Yes, it does. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Keep watching and thanks. All righty. Okay, bye-bye. We have Jerry in Wyoming, Robert in Seattle, Emily in Ogden. Jerry, you're on Heart of the Matter. Jerry? Hello? Hey, Jerry, you're on the air. Hey, I got a question for you. Um, on Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, you know, Paul says, and he says in these last days he's spoken to us by his son. Yeah. Have you ever had a Mormon tell you that Paul was referring to his last days instead of Jesus's? I've never heard that. Uh, it's an inter I mean, that's an interesting take. You could say that. But uh, has in these last days, I, I, I think there could be application for that, actually that Paul was talking about then in this dispensation, this last dispensation that Christ had been teaching, that in these last days before the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, he speaks to us by his son. But if it had application for the church then, it would have application to us now. 
Um, it, I mean, that's one thing about reading the, the New Testament is even though it has application at the time, it's certainly going to have application to the body today. We don't read the New Testament now and say, well, that doesn't have anything to do with us. We, we, you know, we don't have to follow it at all. It is our manual. So I don't think it would hold water, really, if you were able to sit down and talk them through. But I think it's kind of a good argument. Okay. Yeah, I just I was talking to a fellow last week, and he ran that by me. And yeah. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, you know, let, me, let me give you another one. You know, when Jesus gives that parable of how uh, the husbandmen, uh, the Lord sends workers into the vineyard, and the people kill the workers, and so he sends more, and they kill, and, 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 they, and more and more and more, and they kill and kill and kill. And then last of all, he sent his son, in whom they kill, and so we have a picture there of prophets, 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 and then last of all, the son comes. We have Jesus saying that John is the last of the prophets, of the law and the prophets, John the, and John the Baptist was. So I, there's a lot of other arguments. If you go on our website at hotm.tv, go to 2010, look at the show Prophets, it'll give you all those passages to help refute uh, the, the one resistance he's giving you to Hebrews 1 uh, and 1 and 2. Okay, well, appreciate your time. Okay, Jerry, thanks for calling. Thank you. Bye. We're going to Robert in Seattle, Washington. Roberto! Hi, Sean. Hi. Hello? I wish hey. you would have responded um, with, hello! Hey, Robert, you're on the air. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I would have uh, a lot of fun talking with you, Sean. Um, you're definitely an interesting guy. Um, getting... Uh, uh, you know, bringing in a lot of uh, concepts, uh, monergism, synergism, you know, and uh, um, just kind of right up my alley. I enjoy that kind of stuff. So um, I guess uh, I'll give you a little back background. I'm a Mormon, and as I'm studying this kind of stuff, um, it's actually led me into Mormonism. And, and actually, you could say that I've, I've left Mormonism, but I've become a Latter-day Saint. And when... When you talk about um, Joseph Smith and how he was able to come up with Calvinism or uh, come up come up with a rebuttal to Calvinism like this, um, I can only see inspiration. I mean, I, I, you know, he, he wasn't that smart of a guy. He was very smart. Um, <laughs> he was a genius. Well, he was, but he wasn't. You know, I mean, there was um, his ability to take, pick, and choose different doctrines that existed in the early church. And I understand, you know, they were, they were kind of around in, in, uh, um, in New York and, and uh, in, so, you know, from the preachers that were preaching. But he was able to take all of those different diverse doctrines and pick and choose out of the best of them and create a, a gospel or... A, he didn't create it, but he was able to pick the, the best things out of the gospel and create something that I don't see has any holes in it. You know, yeah, it's, it's, it's a seamless, bo that, it's a seamless uh, philosophical system, uh, Robert. I would agree with you. And I, as I said earlier, Smith was a great synthesizer of religious information, no doubt. The problem is uh, he went outside and was able to create from his own mind um, his own world. And it doesn't, it is not harmonious with a sound uh, exegetical study of, of the Bible. And there's the problem. Now, if you wanna say, look, I embrace his uh, theories over what the Bible has to say, I'll say, that's fine. Have, it, have at it, my friend. We'll be friends and let's go have dinner. But don't say that it's Christian because he has, like you said, he's constructed another gospel. He has, absolutely. Now, you have to understand, too, read Exiles in the Land of Liberty by Zen. Uh, it'll change your life if you haven't read it in terms of his genius and his ability to, uh, to create abstract, uh, take abstract concepts, theological concepts, and put them into his body. Uh, he was tutored. Joseph Smith was kind of like the guy... Uh, there's a, I'm sorry if I'm rambling, Robert. Let me just tell you this cartoon. It was in Sunstone years ago. He's sitting there at the breakfast table, and his wife says, get out and get a job. And he says, I'm just trying to drink my, my tea. Just get me my tea, and I'll leave. And so she brings him a cup of tea, and he looks in the tea, and he says, ooh, interesting formation in these tea leaves. 
You see, he was able to take anything, like any good salesman, any good con man, and bring it in and make it fit with his, his theology. If you want to believe it, Robert, go at it. I'm sorry you've bought into it because it is full of holes in terms of consistency historically. Read uh, Palmer's book, Insider's View of Mormon Origin. The whole first vision and the priesthood thing was a, a reconstructed concoction. And it was, it's not historically true. So you haven't really received the true picture if you haven't read those two books. Well, no, I, I know what's in those books, and, you know, I know that there are definitely issues of, uh, you know, historical uh, evidence and everything. However, when you say, you know, that uh, what he taught was not in the Bible, everything, that, everything was in the Bible, and it does teach the Bible. It just teaches it in a different way than well, what you've been taught and, and what... No, I wasn't taught that. Teaches, but he was able to take a, a, a church and fit it directly between Protestantism and Catholicism. He was that smart. He was that smart. Yeah. Well, and, and I don't think he could have done it alone. I think that he had to have the inspiration and the help from God to do that. Okay. You know, but... I'm, not, I'm not saying that everything, uh, every uh, revelation from his came about in the way that he said it did, but in, a, in the sense that he was able to create something that fit in the Bible perfectly between those two camps okay. is, just, is just incredible. Well, let me ask you, Robert, would you expect a good counterfeit to just totally be off kilter with what the Bible says? Or would you expect a counterfeit, the best counterfeit, to be very close and to be able to ride right alongside with all these other theories? Um, no, I, I don't think a counterfeit could have come uh, in, that, in that way because of the way that it fits the Bible so well. Yeah, it doesn't fit the Bible so well. And that's why Christianity, historically, from the scholars down to the guys who sit in their shacks and read it back in Arkansas, no offense to the Arkansasian people, um, uh, they all know Mormonism and its doctrines are not biblical. It doesn't matter denomination, okay. Robert. It's not biblical. What specifically do you think is not biblical then? Okay, if you go back to our archives, because we can't cover it tonight, we have 370-hour-long uh, uh, shows. You pick. You choose any show, listen to it, that has to do with a comparison between Mormonism... Give me an example. Um, Sabbath day, tithing... Um, faith, grace, salvation, soteriology, exaltation. Uh, I mean, any of those. Okay. 2010. Hey, hang one. on. Everything, everything priesthood, but exaltation priesthood is, is in the Bible. Priesthood is everything an Everything that you've said is in the Bible. Everything. Okay, but look, at, here's the thing, Robert. You can say everything is in the Bible. That's fine. But, you can, but what he's done is he's taken and he's added to so much of what's in the Bible, it changes the meaning of what's in the Bible. That's what you're missing. So while you can well, say, well, he talks about... And let, me, let me kind of explain here, because I, when, when you get into theology that's outside of what the Bible is, yeah. um, the, the Bible and the Book of Mormon are what is salvation, okay? okay. Joseph Smith was able to take everything above and beyond salvation and add to, uh, I mean, create exaltation. Um, but that's above salvation. How come so Jesus didn't do that, that pertaining Robert? To our salvation Robert. And, and entering into the kingdom of God and the celestial kingdom. Robert, how come Jesus didn't do that? How come Paul didn't do that? How come it took Joseph Smith to do it? Um, well, because uh, you need to first be sal uh, you first need to receive salvation before you can receive exaltation. But how come Joseph Smith had to be the one to reveal this to the world, and how come Jesus didn't tell us that? How come how come his gospel, what he talks about, he doesn't say anything about what Joseph brought in? There's nothing about new and everlasting covenant. Jesus said there's nothing about marriage being eternal. What what about all those things? How come Joseph had to add to what Jesus said? Well, if you look at what Jesus even brought up, they killed him for it. Okay, I don't, you're losing you know, me now. <laughs> I mean, it, again, it's how a very come, minimal. How come? Very, so the Bible's not enough, is what you're saying? I'm saying the Bible is enough for salvation. Okay, so Joseph then gave us exaltation. How come Jesus <laughs> and Paul didn't give us exaltation, Robert? Well, they did. They just couched it in. Uh, um, certain scriptures. Oh, so Joseph, like Muhammad, I mean, comes, comes along and he's the final witness and he explains what, how Jesus failed to teach us and how Paul failed to really articulate it well enough. 
He, along comes Joseph, and he knows how to do it. Uh, not, not just because of Joseph, but because of the times and the religious freedoms that we have. Uh, if you look, they... Jesus no, had like religious say, they freedom. Killed Jesus, they killed Paul uh, for, for teaching what he did teach. Are you trying to say then that they weren't able to get out the full truth, that Joseph was necessary to complete what Jesus uh, couldn't? Yes. Okay. And, and we're going to end on that. And I give you every right as a friend to believe that or that ponies are gods in embryo. I don't care. But understand, no Christian believes that anybody else needs to come along and add to what Jesus did. You do. So have at it. Good luck with it. Go on to your exaltation as Joseph explained it for you. Go ahead. I'm going to go. Here's the difference, Robert. You go with that. I'm going and saying... Dude, I, to God, I have nothing that I can bring except I believed on your son. If that doesn't do it, I'm gone. Go ahead. I trust in you. You're going to go and give all your explanations for exaltation that you've received from Joseph. Good luck. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll see you. All right. Uh, we're going Emily in Ogden, line four. Emily, you're on Heart of the Matter. Hi. Um, I just had a question. Um, because I used to go to a church, um, and the pastor and the youth pastor believe in, um, Calvinism. Uh, and, um, I'm just wondering, like, so do you think that, you know, as a, as a, a Christian, you know, going to, you know, trying to find the right church for my family, is it, should I stay away from, you know, a church who the pastors believe? on the foundations of, of Calvinism? Should I stay away from all of that stuff? Or, I mean, because, I mean, they don't, I mean, they don't teach it. I mean, I just know that, that they, um, seeing the youth going up, the, the youth pastor did teach a lesson one time, and my mom, she freaked out. She's like, then go in here, and it was this whole thing, and they said they wouldn't teach it anymore. So, I mean, I'm just kind of, you know, torn on, you know, like I have a book that the youth pastor wrote. Should I not read it because he believes in Calvinism? You know, I'm just... I just don't know. Well, here's the deal. Any church you go to, including here at campus, uh, people who come here, you're going to hear things that are wrong. You're going to hear things from the pulpit that uh, are inconsistent with God and his love. Anywhere you go. If you, if you go to that church, a lot of Calvinists uh, don't teach the principles. Even They don't even interlace it in their messages. They just believe it personally, and that's how they walk. But if, you're, if, if your pastor and youth leader is a hyper-Calvinist, I would uh, get on your horse and ride because yeah. that, everything is couched then in the five points. So you kind of have okay. to use wisdom and see. I mean, I believe Calvinists are Christian. I believe they believe in, in faith. I just think that they've been fed a bill of goods kind of like Robert has. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks so much. I, I hope that helps somewhat, Emily. But you'll Definitely decide. Does. Okay, God bless you. You too, love me. Bye-bye. Okay, really quickly. Oh, God, we got some great emails. I've got about 15 uh, such good ones because you never know about the calls. Um, let me see if I can find one that's worth just knocking off. How about this, this one? This is from a bishopric member. Doesn't want to go. It goes unnamed. Went to sacrament meeting December 23rd, 2012, just last Christmas, wanting to and expecting to hear and sing Christmas music and hear Christmas messages because Joseph Smith's birthday was the same week. The program consisted of one Christian hymn, two talks about Joseph Smith, and the congregation standing and singing praise to the man. That's a song to Joseph Smith. Very disappointing. If this is mentioned on your program, please don't use my name because two years ago I was in the bishopric and I'm trying to keep peace in my family. There's an insider's view of what's going on in Mormonism today. Yes, we're Christian, but even Jesus shares his celebrated birthday with Joseph. We love you. Go to HOTM if you have interest in anything that's going on there, our archives, products, stuff like that. And we'll see you next week here on Heart of the Matter.